one of the the things that I'm most interested in is she was the initial target of Gamergate. Yeah. So it's interesting that that after dealing with the toxicity of the game, game fandom, community, she she's decided to, to start writing comic books, which is like at best a lateral move. Ugh. For any occasion, so keep patting down, waiting. Comics and conversation, keep the conversation moving along. Keep bringing comics, keep your local store strong. If it's hard, then it's a job for the challenger. Comics and conversation, y'all. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. And now, here are Patrick Brower and W. Dal Bush. Dal, it's happened. What? It's out now. The Divorce Gun CD, The Winning Days of the World. Not only is it available in store at Challengers, hard copy, hard, like a on actual a, on a compact disc. Yes, actual printed compact disc you can get. You can buy it digitally on iTunes. Uh-huh. You can buy it digitally on Amazon. Uh-huh. You can stream it at Spotify and Amazon Music and Apple Music and like Pandora and I don't know Shazam. It's going to be on Shazam uh-huh. and. A whole bunch of other services I didn't even know existed. I'll be honest, I'm holding out for the vinyl. Uh, what color would you want the vinyl? <laughs> uh, I was hoping to get the uh, the the picture disc limited one, the, the, oh, the man. globe one. Oh, that's an expensive one. I know. Well, that's why I'm waiting. Uh, uh, right. How how long is the new album? Like 36 minutes. So we're just going to go right into playing that in its entirety, and then come back to do the like no no, no. Patreon, we, we, thank we, yous we, and all sorts. We of play stuff? we play a song, then we discuss it in depth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, also, the weird thing about the different platforms is it's a different price each place. Weird. Like it is five ninety nine on iTunes. It's seven ninety nine in the store because you get an actual copy. It's like six something on Amazon. Like I don't. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I don't. I don't understand the platforms. I don't have to. If someone buys it on a day that you work, will you sign it? I mean, I won't offer, but if they ask, if they ask, you'll yeah. get it. Okay, sure. There's not you're not doing like a special signing day where that's going to happen. Uh, no. Okay. I mean, I kind of wanted to do a release party. Uh huh. It it was supposed to be the anniversary party, but the timing didn't work out. Yep. Uh, and also, I don't know that I would be playing it in the store often because I've been listening to these songs for the past year and a half. Sure. Pl- so plus, you know, there's swears on at least one of them. There's one swear on one of them, which is why it rates an explicit rating. On Apple Music, there's one f bomb in one song. That's all. That's all. The divorce can used to be for the whole family. What happened? What changed? What changed was Bob's balls broke. Because uh. that's the song. But anyway, that's not necessarily comic related. Even though no. <laughs> it will be playing in the store, in theory. Uh, Donovan listened to my music all day, and she said somebody asked her, like, "Hey, uh, is is this Cinderella?" She just said. <laughs> I don't know. Sure. <laughs> I said, oh, Donovan. It was, it was not Cinderella. <laughs> it was not Cinderella. She doesn't you know, know how to look at an iPod. I'm, like, people, like... Oh, no, they, no. There's, there's been times where you and I are working in the store together, and your iPod will be playing, and you'll be out of the, the room for whatever reason. Someone will say, who is this? And it's always something where I'm like, I don't know. And I'll have to look at it and go, uh, like, Animal Drive? Yeah. Yeah, Animal Drive. And they'll go, oh, okay. Hold on. Do they say, who is this? No. Or do they say, who is this? It's in between that. But okay. it's definitely more like, I like how this sounds. Okay. I don't know what this is. Because you, you, it was ambiguous the way you said it. Okay. But it's not that she couldn't do that. I just don't think she cared. Oh, all right. Uh, however, Customer I, service is job I, one. I will say she was extremely helpful to a lot of people today. True. And, uh, and there's she, a few special project things that fell in her lap that she took care of that I yeah. was glad for. Yeah. Yeah. She she's very thorough in her note taking, mm-hmm. and any time there was a question, she had a paragraph explaining it, <laughs> and, and it was good to uh, be able to say, "Yeah, you're right. This this was messed up. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fine. I, I was there for that." Uh, anyway, Dal, there's a couple of topics I wanted to get to as far as the realm of comic book stuff goes. There's two small topics and one, I think, a little meteor topic. That we'll put off to a little bit later. What's this about meteors? Uh, meteors are well, Meteor Man. You remember that Marvel comic? I do. Yeah, and well, based off the movie. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But there was a comic. Yeah, 
Uh, first and foremost is Diane Nelson stepping down from DC Entertainment. Yeah, I guess she had been on a sabbatical for a while, and uh, that sabbatical is now final. Uh, she has uh, stepped down from her position as, I don't even, head of DC Entertainment? President, vice president of DC Entertainment, or something else? I don't know. I do not know what her job entailed. I do know that she was frequently using sound bites, and she was a, a go-to for their media property and quoting for the future of their entertainment division, but I'm unsure of what she actually did. But to be fair, I'm unsure of what everybody actually does. Yeah, when you get at a certain like level of, of executives at major companies like that, it can be difficult to discern like what is your job versus what is everyone else's job. I just remember the splash she made when she got that position because she did not come from a comic background. Yeah, she was from somewhere else within the Warner Brothers family. I think she'd overseen a lot of the Harry Potter merchandising. Okay. And that was so successful for that company that they were like, hey, can you do something about all this DC stuff that doesn't seem to be working? And she sort of did. So it's one thing when uh, someone... She was, by the way, president of DC Entertainment was her title. Okay. It's one thing when someone steps down, but when they don't immediately announce a successor, like, I understand when it's a pope, there's a process. Yes. Uh, for another example... Are you waiting for, like, smoke to go up from, like, a window at, like, the in Warner Burbank? Brothers lot? Yeah. And then it'll be like, okay, sure. they've chosen the new DC Entertainment president. Uh, I just found out this week that Nicholas Grimshaw is leaving the BBC Radio 1 breakfast show. No! In September. Oh. And uh, Greg James is replacing him. Greg James is currently in the drive spot. Uh, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I will miss Grimmy, but Greg James is, is a fine replacement. Okay. But... It's not that he's leaving radio. Grimshaw is just tired of that gig. He's sure. been doing it for six years. That seems like a lot. You know, he has to. He's he's on the radio six thirty to ten every day. Christ. I mean, that's that's, that's pretty early. Plus, he's a a DJ, so he like would DJ late night sets. Ugh, and then have to go right to work. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I know that feeling. Uh, not the DJ part. Uh, but they announced Greg James. Immediately when they said Nick Grimshaw is stepping down. They haven't said where Grimmy's going, but is it better to have the immediate replacement picked out before you make the announcement that the person is leaving? I think so. Because, I mean, this is obviously... The, the information went out on their terms. Yeah, I don't know that there's a, any percentage to, like, d you know, two staggered announcements. You know, it's not like people are... We've got to we've got to hype it up like you don't want to hype it up. You want to make it seem like everything's in good hands. Nothing. There, there's a plan. There's, there's continuity. There's no, no gap in quality. Yeah. You don't want to make it seem like I don't know who's in charge for however long. And then when that person comes on board to take over, how is is anyone helping them with that transition process, or is it just like go? So yeah, these are things that you don't necessarily want to hear. I just feel that with my lack of understanding of how that aspect of the business works. Mm -hmm whoever else or whoever can replace her I don't know that I'll be able to say oh yeah that person's going to do great it depends it, it could be someone from within um, someone who's worked on, on DC films or TV or, or something or more likely it's probably going to be someone from some other like uh, studio or someone else within Warner Brothers I think it should be somebody that I don't know from somewhere else so I, I will give them more of a chance to sure. do but again I, I don't know what impact they will have uh, it's just different than the way Marvel has been releasing and this is uh, apples and pears but the variant covers for Captain America number one <laughs> sure. it's like one or two more announced every single day like they did for Spider-Man 800 DC's doing the same thing with Batman 50 Ugh. there was another Ali Garza cover that was released today and it's unclear where are these going to be? Because I There's think a, only only three or four of them are going to be like through Diamond, which means the rest of these covers they're showing are store exclusives, but they're not yeah. saying what stores. Uh, I've like, seen there's a cover. I've seen store exclusives on on the boards. Uh, I guess there's a like a Joshua Middleton. Yeah, it's just weird in to, veil. to show again like um like an Ali Garza cover as a news story on comic book resources and not have it be like this is exclusive through Midtown or this is exclusive through. DCBS or this exclusive through whomever. Even some stores that are posting their covers online on the boards are not necessarily... It's like people have to say, what is that? Oh, it's my exclusive cover. But I know you can't compare jobs with 
covers covers you want to hype and get excited. Yeah. Uh, they're they're not they're not exciting at all. Yeah. Well, with publishing they're in general, you vastly wanna, underwhelming. You want to build some excitement. That's the idea. Is we're going to show you a Spider Geddon logo, and then a few days later, we're going to show you a Spider Geddon cover image with some creatures attached, and then eventually we'll do an announcement that tells you what Spider Geddon is, how long it's running, where it's going to be published, whatever. But with something like I mean, the very... people who are in in charge of a company, you do not want that sense of like slow rollout. That's the worst thing you could do. They've already told <laughs> us it's not going to be good. The, it, the announcement was a little underwhelming. That's true. I like the artist a lot. I think yeah. the writer's okay. Yeah. And everything, without knowing the story, the image is very, I don't know, you guys like Spider-Verse, there's more of that. But, but at the same it's time, different. you're just starting Spider-Man over. Well, that's what's interesting about this, because I, as someone who's excited about Nick Spencer's run on Amazing Spider-Man, which is going to be starting in July, yeah, uh, for them to, to, in the fall, be promoting Spider-Geddon as a spider event was like, man, when is this thing going to start? Like, issue three? Well, no, it's going to be a completely separate story by a completely separate creative team, which means the main book might not have to tie into it, which just then begs the question of, like you're saying, why do this right now? Yeah, You just finished Dan Slott's run, which was a huge finale. You can't give the other team a little bit of breathing room, but Marvel never does. No. Like, how many times has L. Ewing been forced to start a series with a line-wide crossover? Like, th- why do they keep doing this to creators? And making that part of the launch strategy is, here's a bunch of other stuff that you can get to. Like, man, just... Do you think one that story. this will lead into the rebranding of Miles Morales and Gwen Stacy? Probably. Maybe spin a new Miles series out of it. I, I obviously don't know what did we Did we with. talk about one thing that I thought was really funny from Amazing Spider-Man 800? There's a, a scene in the beginning where all of the various... Uh, Spider-Man adjacent characters have been uh, badly damaged after their fight with yeah. the Red Goblin, and uh, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, is uh, is checking on his allies to see who's okay. So he says, you know, anti-venom and Silk and um, Spider-Woman, Miles, because you you can't you can't just call can't him Spider-Man. Spider-Man. There's already a Spider-Man there. He's Spider-Man. Like that's always been the problem with Miles Morales in the regular Marvel universe is. He was never supposed to be another Spider-Man. He, he was, was supposed to be, to be the Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Which, way back when they announced the Miles series first coming out of Secret Wars, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. Maybe what they'll do is they'll take Peter Parker, who has Parker Industries, I think, at that point. Let him be a science guy. Let him be the mentor character to Miles. So Peter's still around. He'll be in that Miles series. But Miles is Spider-Man now. Nope. nope. Amazing Spider-Man was announced a few weeks later. That's it. They're doing both. And it's just, it's so weird. So yeah, hopefully they'll they'll have some answer for, is he just going to be called Spider-Man forever? Because it doesn't really make any sense. But he's earned it. And that Spider-Verse trailer looks so good. For the movie, it does. Yeah. Yeah, but that one makes sense because here's another universe where Peter Parker isn't Spider-Man, or at least isn't anymore. That's the only way you can have multiple characters named Spider-Man is they have to be the only Spider-Man for their world. If there's six guys called Spider-Man running around... It doesn't make any sense. I've seen memes comparing the model sheet for adult Peter Parker Spider-Man uh-huh. to Adam Sandler. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's close. That's fine. It's a uh, valid way to go. I don't know the legalities of dropping in audio from a trailer into a podcast. I mean, I would think that they want the publicity and the promotion. I have no idea. So we won't, but it's definitely worth watching. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a very sure. exciting movie, and, and it's the movie that Dal is most excited for for the rest of this year. Yeah, I mean, it's tied with Ant-Man and Wasp, but I can't think of anything else I'd be as excited for as those two movies. I'll go see a bunch of other stuff, but very little gets me as excited. It's true. As Bumblebee. Mm, remains to be seen. Come on. Uh, it was an okay trailer, but that's a franchise that has a lot of work to do to win over my confidence. Well, I've uh, not, see- not even seen the trailer, and I'm not looking forward to it. You're not missing much. I'm sure I'm not. It's just a teaser. There's no real, like, meat to it. It's just saying... Here's the kind of movie we're going to make, which doesn't look completely horrible. So, step in the right direction. Okay, next topic. Mm -hmm. GameStop is going to be selling comics in some of their stores. Yeah, I think 20 locations to start with are going to be uh, doing a a trial of of selling comics. Uh, GameStop in general has 
diversified their business model to incorporate more geek friendly things uh they bought think geek i'm pretty sure um and so they've been stocking a lot of the stuff that think geek would stock where it's not just you know uh anime statues and plushes and stuff like that but it's a lot of like you know superhero backpacks and t-shirts i mean and... I've, I've bought stuff off of think geek online numerous times yeah. I only ever seem to go into a GameStop when it's to buy you a present. Yes. Yeah, it's a lot of, like, they have a whole section in most of their stores. And depending on the size of the store, that'll determine the size of the the Think Geek section. But weirdly, um, they had had an a, a investor report or filing recently, and they'd mentioned that they'd maybe overcompensated for the collectibles category and maybe made that section a little too big. So they're going to be paring back on a lot of that in, in stores that have those uh, sections. So it's weird to then say, and we're also going to start carrying comics when you've realized that, hey, we strayed a little too far from our core business model. Well, I'm sure out of the how many GameStop stores we estimate for the country? For the country? I have no idea. I mean, it's got to be over 1,000, though. But yeah, so only 20. Like, there's got to be 20 stores that do really well with the merchandise, and maybe they're the comic stores. I guess. But the guy who's in charge of that is the guy that brought all the comics into Hastings, right? Was that the... That's what I think I'd read, yeah. I don't, I don't remember his name. No. And if you recall, listener, Hastings went under and owed Diamond Comics millions of dollars. Although someplace that had reported on this had clarified that that section of Hastings was profitable. Okay. So while, yes, that's all true, um, the company as a whole failed, not necessarily that part of the company. I gotcha. That's like Toys R Us Canada. Yeah, exactly. Like, Toys R Us Canada was doing great, but... They were still having they to were pay getting for dragged Toys R Us by, America's yeah, the, the US debt restructuring. The company. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what uh, what they do with the comic stuff. Um, I know that there's, there's a lot of stores that are probably very worried about it. Um, there were stores that, that had some intense competition from Hastings when they were doing... Um, comics as a category I think the difference here is that and, and this is all speculation because we don't 100% know how they're going to approach comics and what they're going to do with it but Hastings was like a, a, a full service entertainment store so they, they were used to stocking in depth on a lot of different categories, packaged media, that kind of thing, um, CDs and, and DVDs and Blu-rays and video games here's the thing about GameStop's business model it's built around two things it's built around pre-orders, and it's built around used games. Specifically for the first one, it is about not carrying stuff in, in depth. It's about trying to get you to sign up for an advance. It's about locking in those numbers. So um, they don't have to donate a lot of shelf space. Yeah, it's it, they don't, they'll order, you know, stock of certain games, but the emphasis on the, the, the new games part of their business model, and this is a top-down thing where, where store managers and employees are expected to deliver this, it is hitting pre-order numbers. They expect a certain amount of pre-orders for all these different games, and that's your in-store sales quota. It's not about selling you a game right now today. It's getting you to pre-order this game from them. So, Good luck doing that with comics. So, well, I was going to say. All right. Um, Sorry. So for people who are you know, not jazzed about uh, the way that your local comic shop might uh, do stuff on a pre-order basis, GameStop is 100% worse. <sighs> A hundred percent. So that part of the market is actually way worse. The other thing is that a lot of the way that their games work is on the used game model. It's uh, they will buy a game from you for a dollar and sell it for ten, or they'll buy a game from you for five bucks and sell it for forty. That's a huge part of their model, and I don't know that that version for comics really exists. I'd be interested to see if they have some some corollary for that for comics, where if they're going to have you know a, a a $4 Batman comic from last week they will buy back from you for $0.25 cents and then sell the used Batman comic for a dollar. I don't think you can really do that. I don't know if that really works. Well, my specific hands-on knowledge of GameStop, as I just said before, is uh -huh. not vast. He's going in there once or twice a year. Yeah. From the few that I've been in, mm -hmm. save for like a, a mall store, sure, they all seem significantly smaller than comic shops. Well, yeah, again, a lot of their stuff is, is built around, you know, either used games that they turn quickly or pre-orders that don't take up a lot of space because those are, that's not... Sure. But, I mean, to be a comprehensive... So, so be, well, I was going to say, because of that, then, 
that works to their advantage. So their stores get to be very small footprints. They don't need to get 2,000, 3,000 square foot stores. They can have a, a very um, high level of success with a like 400 or 500 square foot store. Like that's part of the design of the store. Like they, they figured that out. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, but how do you then incorporate an entire new product line? Well, th- this I mean, is... pop vinyls, you can give them X amount of square footage mm-hmm. and still make it work. Sure. I guess th- this was one of the things that surprised me a bit when certain stores, again, because of how Hastings had worked, were very nervous about the competition because, again, like there's a lot of GameStop stores in the United States. Um, just from where Challengers is, I can think of two or three, I think, within probably a two-mile radius. Is um, the one still in the Strachan Van Til Mall? Uh, that's one I think might still be there. Okay. There's probably another one. Did you know that Strachan Van Til is going to be a Burlington Coat Factory? <laughs> no, really? Yeah. Are they going to carry groceries? Uh, no. Pass. Uh, you know what? i got to tell you, mm-hmm. Bur- I, I think I think they're just called Burlington now, not Burlington Coat yeah, Factory. Yeah, they want to get away from the, sure. the only stock. One of the favorite suits I ever bought was from Burlington. Sure. I'm sure I will visit this locale. Yeah. Check them out. But it, so the the thing that was a little surprising to me when certain stores were really nervous about GameStop carrying comics is the closest thing I can think of to how GameStop is probably going to operate as a as a competitor to your local comic shop. And you and I both worked in this era is the early 90s, where every card store in America was like, we'll start carrying comics too. Yep. But what that means isn't we're going to carry 100 different SKUs each week and we're going to have... 14 shelves of graphic novels. What it means is we're going to have Batman 50 and Catwoman 1 and Captain America 1. And, you know, maybe we'll have an image variant cover for a number one, you know, a GameStop exclusive cover. And that's probably going to be it. Like, they'll carry, you know, Batman and Superman and and Amazing Spider-Man and Avengers and Walking Dead. But they're not necessarily going to carry... Ms. Marvel, or Squirrel Girl, or The Terrifics, or... Curse Words. Saga, even. Who knows? Or The Damned, or Kaiju Max. Yeah, or a lot of other comics, because they don't have the square footage to to devote to that. They don't... They're going to carry... Like, the the people that, that they're likely going to be selling to, I don't think they're saying, like, we got to steal business from, you know, niche enthusiast stores, so much as this guy at the counter who's buying... God of War, we can probably sell them a $4 Batman comic as long as we're here. I wonder if they're going to just go all in on all the video game tie-ins. They, they've carried them before. So they, they've carried, you know, Resident Evil comics, and they've or carried Halo, Mortal Kombat Mass comics. Mass Effect. Yeah, I, they don't necessarily carry all of them all the time, but I know I've seen them there before. Um, they've carried, like, the Wildstorm uh, video game comics. I remember seeing those specifically at GameStops. And if, if Hastings style stuff is going to be there. I expect it'll be a little bit more of the, you know, exclusive cover sort of things. Like, they're not going to carry Avengers number one. They'll carry the GameStop exclusive Avengers number one. So they'll be doing books where they can get a a decent, like, promotional deal on it and stuff they can sell on their website, whatever. So I, I don't see this as being a replacement for your local comic shop, unless your tastes are super vanilla I only Very get narrow. Batman comics like then you'll probably be fine but they might not have carried something like Batman White Knight or Batman Creature of the Night they might only carry Batman like that might be it um, I so, wonder yeah. what kind of a footprint they're going to have as far as Diamond goes This is this going to be one account that represents 20 stores 20 separate accounts Well, one of the things I thought was interesting was that um some of this news broke because someone had basically taken a, a screenshot of um, their internal inventory system. So they could say, like, well, look, there's a Batman comic that's going to be in, and it's going to be in on June 15th. And I, I remember seeing it and thinking, June 15th is a Friday. If you're going to be competing with your local comic shop, getting it two days later is probably not going to help you a whole lot. But again, if you're just doing it as an add-on, as a the audience that that likes video games enough to go to a, a dedicated video game store to get them and is maybe already getting geek stuff they don't care they're not looking for this week's batman comic they're just going to say oh a batman comic so i i have a really hard time looking at this as you know intense you know one to one competition now 
I feel like the thing that the people should be a little nervous about is the, the comics industry in general isn't super healthy right now, and a lot of stores are are pretty much hanging on week to week. So while you might not lose customers, you might lose some of the casual stuff. Um, the person who might make two stops on a Friday or whatever to get new video games and new comics, if if they're just casually getting stuff, if they don't really follow titles, they might just, you know, they've got to go to GameStop to pick up Mario Tennis Aces. And while they're there, they might get Avengers and Batman and not bother going to the comic shop. So you could, you know, lose a little bit. And that's maybe the problem is if, if GameStop scoops up, you know, five, six hundred bucks a week in, in your sales, some stores that five, six hundred bucks is the difference between them staying in business or going out of business. Yeah. And the real danger to me to the comics industry through that is if if the comic shop goes out of business because of that, it's not like GameStop is going to pick up those sales. They're not going to start carrying full line because there's an audience now. That audience is just going to be unserved. So, yeah, I, I, I'm i not worried about it, worried about it. I'm curious how they're going to do it. I think the thing that, that especially for, like, the hardcore comics fan, I can't imagine these are these books are going to be in great shape. I'd be real surprised if, yeah. if GameStop is able to take care of those in a way where they're not just destroyed after a few weeks. Knowing that it's only 20 stores, I, I certainly don't think it's going to be one around us. It's possible. And, and, I mean, it is, but even, even if it is, I don't see it as competition. I would prefer it not, but... To I mean, me, this is no different than when, like, Barnes & Noble's carry comics or yeah. whatever. Like, I mean, if anything, like, Barnes & Noble carrying graphic novels is more of a, a competition to us than... GameStop carrying 15 comics a week or whatever. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. And it's such a, a weird non-announcement because there's nothing... There's nothing. It wasn't an announcement. Yeah. Someone found it in their system and went, hey, it looks like we're carrying comics. And then Bleeding Cool posted on it and a lot of places wanted to talk about it. Um, like us! Hooray! Yeah, I, I can't imagine, especially if, if GameStop is intending this as like a 20-store trial, I can't imagine they'd even want to announce it until they know if they want to go forward with it. It'll just yeah. be a thing where you go into a GameStop and it's like, oh, they've got comics now. But yeah, if anything, I really think it's going to be more um, devoted towards store-exclusive variants. Because if you're GameStop and you're ordering for 20 stores or eventually 50 or 100 or 1,000, it's incredibly easy for you to put together the order minimums to do only exclusive covers and why why would you want to do anything else if you could order i mean you're not going to be ordering ones and twos for stores do you know what i mean you're going to be ordering tens and twenties so it's got to be something it's you know i I don't think it's going to be things like um you know immortal hulk number seven or whatever i think by that point they'll be moving on to something else Hey, speaking of Immortal Hulk, okay. Immortal Hulk number one was pretty good. I enjoyed it. I thought yeah. it, it had potential because Al Ewing is a really strong writer and usually has a very cool uh, take on a lot of different things that he's given at Marvel. And while Immortal Hulk wouldn't be on paper uh, a solicitation thing where I'm like, oh, that sounds great. It was like, I'm interested to see what they'll do with it. And yeah. they did something good. Yeah, really really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's darker. It's more of a horror book. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I don't know about you, but it reminded me a lot of the Bruce Jones Hulk stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Which was a great run. It was. Uh, we were talking to someone in the store who, who had chided it for not necessarily being like something you could do a long run of. And nowadays, I'm okay with that. If plenty you just have books, a good story to tell. Yeah, plenty of books I've liked have only run 12, 18, 25 issues. That's fine. I, I, don't, I don't mind if Immortal Hulk only has like one or two good arcs. I will take one or two good arcs. There's comics that don't even manage that, that I don't even read issue two of. Wow. How dare you mock Falcon like that? Oh, the Falcon. Okay, so this is the the bigger topic. The mm-hmm. I don't know if it merits a capital T topic, but this this may have a few parts, and I haven't really worked it out, so you'll have to bear with me as we go. But I need you to come backwards in time with me to April, to C2E2, to the retailer breakfast on Friday morning, to the keynote speech from Steve Jeppe. Oh, I blocked that out of my memory, Patrick. Well, it seemed like his speech had a lot of focus on back issues. And he was really talking up back issues as a potential money maker for stores. Sure, it always has been. Now That was the model for comic shops yes. for 40 years. But specifically having him harp on it then, in hindsight, 
there's a couple of reasons that it could have happened. So there's speculation. First of all, you're aware that he closed down the Cartoon Art Museum. Yes, and donated most of its uh, exhibits to the Smithsonian? Yes. So most of the coverage in the comics industry was Steve Jeppe donates his personal collection to the Smithsonian. Outside of the comics industry, the press was Comic Art Museum closed. So there's already the way you can look at it where... How do you want to spin it? Yeah. Yeah. Was it... I mean, I'm sure it wasn't profitable from the beginning. I'm sure Museums it's... Museums rarely are. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm sure it's his rogues gallery, man. I'm sure it's sure. just a thing he wanted to do because he loves comic art and sure. wanted to increase that appreciation. What, one of the many things that Kevin Eastman was dumb about with his money was opening like a comics art museum and finding out, oh, there's nowhere to keep this thing afloat. Yeah. So, on the one hand, you can say, maybe at the time he was giving this keynote address... He knew he was going to be doing this. And maybe he was hoping that by donating this massive amount of art into a broader public forum, into a place that has more prestige than his museum did, and the potential to have more visitors, maybe he was hoping that that would be a thing that would get more general people of the country to be interested in older comics and that was his way of trying to prepare us for increased back issue sales I know that's a stretch I see you're not really following me or are you? I'm sorry I am, okay. I think, yeah I, I'm, I, I'm curious where this is going but yes, okay uh, sidebar our back issue sales have been going up. Yeah, it's true. Uh, They're only a buck, by the way, 99 cents. We've been filling those boxes, too. Yeah, um, constantly, constantly. Now that we have Gabby full-time on Thursdays, a lot more work is getting done. And, I mean, a lot of stuff has been, like, not to segue into segue, but uh, our our new comic shelves, not the actual new this week section, but the, the comics shelves themselves... Uh, so much stuff has needed multiple spots that a lot of things have needed to be cleared out a little faster than I would have liked. Yeah. Uh, when in a week I have to suddenly make, you know, 10, 11 spots for a Amazing Spider-Man 800. It's like, I, I got to, 10 things Something, have to go. Something's got to get cut. Something's got to get cut. Sure. So, yeah, there's a few things in this past week where I'm like, oh, I thought I'd do this later in the month. But nope, today, it's got to go right now. Okay, so that's that's speculation A. Okay. 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 Uh, and and I'll be honest. A lot of those dots being connected was me thinking about this. Okay. This is not a theory I read somewhere else. This is a thing I put together. Okay. Because this next part is a theory that I read, and it's a little bit darker. Maybe Steve Jeppy was trying to hype up back issues and get stores more excited for that, because. Diamond is on its way out. On its way out, huh? Uh, either he's leaving or he's, they're sh- they're shutting leaving, down. Like he's there. We don't know if he's a Diane Nelson of. Uh, I would uh, I would be surprised if Diamond was in any sort of serious, i.e., going away tomorrow or this year financial trouble, considering how much money they've put into their warehouse renovations. Okay, but so this this is the question that that I'm, I'm sure. posing. What if they do? I have no idea. I mean, that's the entire North American comics industry as we know it would be in massive trouble. Yeah, there's that would be catastrophic, and I don't, I don't want to say too big to fail, but there's literally no short term solution for Diamond going away. There's no way to get product to stores. There's no way, like, Comicsology and and Amazon and whatever other venues people have to sell digital stuff is not nearly robust enough to take the place of the North American comics industry. It's just not. Like, not by a long shot. Publishing would basically go away. That's that's why I don't think it's going to happen. Well, sure, but this is just a... 
Worst case scenario. An worst, apocalyptic worst case scenario. scenario. I, it, it would literally be apocalyptic. Like, basically everything you know about the North American comics publishing scene would vanish. There's there's almost no way it could survive. Um, I, I fully believe that something new would sprout up quickly. Not yeah. quick enough to save most stores. There would be... But there would be something com- else. Com- or... Okay. A bunch of little things. No. Uh, comics is a medium that, would, that was dismissed. would be fine. There's just... Like, take literally any company. Like, if Marvel or, or DC, which are, you know, some of the best capitalized companies in North American comics publishing, if Diamond stopped tomorrow, if if they had little to no warning and Diamond just ceased to exist, they stopped, they could not pay Marvel for whatever, and they just basically said, take all your stuff back. Come get it. The only two avenues Marvel would have to sell their comics would be graphic novels through bookstores and Amazon, and digital comics through Comixology and Amazon. We, from what we know, from what we've been told about the digital comic scene, that's that's additive. That's not a replacement, and it's not anywhere near as successful as, as print publishing is. A few comics here and there under very specific budgetary restrictions can be produced to appeal to a digital-first audience. But even then, the idea is we're going to republish it and repackage it, and it's going to have additional sales somewhere else. And graphic novels, we've been told again and again and again, the graphic novel can can be successful and can keep a book going, but single issue sales still matter. Even your your Ms. Marvels and Unbeatable Squirrel Girls, the, the graphic novel sales are huge for those, but, but the, the month to month issues still need to deliver. They need to hit a certain level to to be worth paying the creative teams to keep that stuff going. Um, without that sort of week to week, month to month revenue, you you can't make up those sales numbers anyplace else. Those creators need to get paid. That Those offices need to get pay, pay, be paid for. The utilities need to be paid for. All of the stuff that goes into running a comics company, that money needs to keep coming in. And, you know, Barnes & Noble is not going to start selling a, a ton more graphic novels. And Amazon isn't suddenly going to be selling a ton more graphic novels. Like, it, the scramble will be so chaotic and take so long okay, to sort of but shake out do you think that no one's making any money in the meantime and that's it they've already started working toward this because they've got to have these major corporations have to have a, a what if scenario a, a plan b if you will well I, like how how quickly could another hero's world spring up how quickly could dcc by the way dc used to have a clause in their contract mm-hmm. that if diamond was ever yeah, they, in trouble they they would buy them out right but, they had right every free but that's that's gone um I, I think most of, I would assume the brokered publishers, the certainly the top tier ones like Marvel and DC, probably have a very good idea of how healthy Diamond is at any time and kind of what their exposure looks like on being a brokered publisher with that company. Um, you know, your smaller companies, you know, Dynamite and... Uh, Oni. And Oni and, you know, Dark Horse may not know. They may have a good idea of how healthy Diamond is at any point based on, you know, accounts receivable and all that sort of stuff. But I am sure DC and Marvel would be well aware of any potential failure of Diamond as an entity well before it happens. And while they might, they definitely, you know, with any company like that, with any company like Marvel or DC, you want to diversify. You want to have a bunch of different channels going. So if one of them should fail for any reason... You can pick up the slack, but Diamond accounts for so much of comics publishing, especially for single issue comics. Like, you know, graphic novels and through through the book trade and, and digital comics, some of that stuff we can't necessarily know or we don't have huge numbers on. But like the book scan numbers that we see for most superhero comic graphic novels are not great. They're not huge numbers. No. Um, they're certainly not the biggest part of, of the book market. You know, that's uh, kids and, and YA and manga. Like, it's not going to be Astonishing X-Men Volume 1 trade. So, and since so much of what Marvel's publishing, for example, is superhero stuff that has a very specific superhero audience, if that market goes away, like, if Diamond goes away, pretty much every comic shop in North America, short, like, Quimby's and Floating World, are probably going to evaporate. I don't know that Midtown could survive even. Like, so much of their stuff is that product. And if that product disappears, that's at least half their business gone. I assume we would just swap sidekicks and 
challengers. I, we, all of our, we got a bunch more money to give to Baker and Taylor. I guess that's right. Yeah. I, I mean, literally, what would we do? What is our plan B? Could we make a go of it just really revving up the non broker publishers? Yeah. Well, here's, here's the, the, the brass tacks of it. In order to make that sort of shift from one type of market to another, you have to plan for a certain amount of instability. And instability means we don't know how much money we're going to make, um, which means... Oh, you, we already have that. You need... Th- not like this. We have an idea of, like, here's a range. This is, like, it could be, you know, minus 10%. It could be minus 90%. We don't know. So you basically need weeks or months of being able to say, what if it's minus 100%? How are we going to pay our bills? If you can't do that, you're not going to weather it. And and that's why, again, even Midtown, like one of the largest accounts in the U.S., they would not make it. I don't think they'd be able to, to handle that instability for however long it takes. Uh, but like I said, I mean, the comics as a medium would absolutely exist. Most of the people who oh, are sure. doing stuff through like Patreon and stuff, they'll be fine. If anything, they might do better. But yeah, no, it's if Diamond were to go away, no, that's it. There is literally no alternative, at least for single issue comics. Like, there's no one who carries them because Diamond is the exclusive distributor of all of these companies. So there is no nationwide distribution chain that could be like, all right, sure, we'll start carrying The Damned and Kaiju Max and whatever. Like, there's nobody. The few places that have tried to do, to basically be like Capital City, where it's like, here's everybody else, nobody lasts. Haven? Yeah, nobody lasts. It's impossible to do it. The amount of, of money you have to sink into just logistics, like, it's not possible. That's why Diamond is as big as they are, is they have to be. Yeah, that's true. In order to get that stuff to stores in the, in the way that they have to every single week, yeah. You, you need that many warehouses and that many trucks and that much manpower and everything else that goes into it. Well, like I said, this is just uh, people looking back at the keynote address sure. and trying to decipher it and think there was a, a hidden meaning. As far as we know, there is, like, my guess and their guess is wrong. Sure. And I think, if anything, I think Jeppy stepping down? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That, none of that would shock me. He's a guy that's been at it for a long time, and he's at an age where you retire from things. I was going to make a Brooklyn Brawler reference, because <laughs> even though he's not from Brooklyn, he reminds me of Steve Lombardi so much. Sure. But I'm afraid that would get lost on the majority of people listening to this. Probably. You'd have to have seen Steve Jeppy recently to be able to say, oh, I get that. Or seen the Brooklyn Brawler recently as well. Yeah, I suppose. Here's hoping for a stronger future and a better foundation. Yeah. For which we can sell comics. To which we can sell comics? Through which we at, can sell At comics. which. Towards with. Uh-huh. Forward with we can sell comics. Uh, unrelated to all of this, uh, congratulations to Colt Cabana and CM Punk for uh, winning their court case mm-hmm. this week. Where they were being sued by... Their, their single elimination lawsuit. Yeah, it's, it's weird though because it was like two def- uh, one plaintiff and two defendants. So it's like handicap a handicap match. Like a yeah, exactly. It's exactly. It's a handicap match. Colt's podcast that he just put up at the end of this week was every day of the trial he had audio notes at the end of it. Uh-huh. So it was pretty great to hear him all the way through. Sure. But the best part was his introduction is the hey, welcome to the podcast. Uh, this week it's an audio journey through the trial that uh, I just spent the last amount of you know the last month of my life working. Spoiler alert: I fucking won. <laughs> and then it goes right into it. Nice. Uh, really good listen. I, I enjoyed it very much. Cool. Uh, I, I know that has nothing to do with comics, but they're both friends of the store. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to... Uh, and I, I did talk to them both after the fact to offer them congratulations. But nice. I wanted to point it out publicly. Sure. Uh, I just came from an art show over at the Line Dash Gallery, which is right on Western and... Cortez, Western, and Augusta. Augusta, yeah. Like, right, but the, between those two. The, the nearest major intersection. Uh, Steve Seeley had a, a, a show called He Said, She Said, which is uh, um, two companion pieces, two ever, like, each, each piece is two paintings, uh, a man and a woman, and it's the same under image for the most part of the man and woman, but they all have different attributes. Like there was uh, one where 
uh, devil dinosaur was coming out of the man's head. Cool. And Monstroso was coming out of the woman's head. Cool. I mean, it was uh, really fun stuff like that. And Steve Seeley, as you all know, is a, a comics creator. He's the co-creator of Hoax Hunters for Image. Mm-hmm. Uh, co-creator of Trash Bridge. Mm-hmm. He wrote a Hack Slash series. He's done a bunch of covers. Uh, I don't know how long the show is running for, but it's definitely worth taking a look at if you were in the Chicago area and want to see some fun original paintings. And that reminds me of a story I wanted to mention a week or so ago. Uh, we had another uh, artist who was in town for a, an event come by the store, Derek Hess, who mainly does uh album covers for like metal bands and stuff like in flames uh-huh. but he's done he did some captain america covers for a, a mini series that I, I legitimately don't remember the name for but uh our friend chris had said oh you should stop by challengers because he's a comics fan mm-hmm. and he did and uh he brought it brought a copy of his the book that he was promoting uh, a hardback collection of work that he did for the month of may it's all about mental health Okay. And that is definitely a topic that is prevalent, not only in today's society, but today specifically. Yeah. As, uh, I guess, look, we can we can call him a comic creator. Comics creator, Anthony Bourdain, uh, left us. Yeah. So it's a thing that people are talking about, so sure. that uh, the Derek Hess book is is interesting. I uh, got a little bit down there, just trying to, to ramp it up with... Some new things we're doing up in the the future here at Challengers in Chicago, you know. Uh, We already talked at at length about our Adventure Time art show. And by the time this episode airs, uh, we will already have uh, completed the Kids Comics Workshop with Gabby Mendez and Shake a Lug 2 for uh, promoting Lemonade Summer. That will have just happened. And right when this goes up, it's another episode of not episode, but uh, meeting of Women's Comics Night, mm-hmm. also featuring Gabby Mendez and Shake a Lug too. Yeah. Uh, and we have the upcoming Correspondence Night, um, our Correspondence Club, that uh, Donovan Challenger is spearheading, and she has a, uh, she made a, a rubber stamp. Cool. A pre-inked stamp. Cool. So it could be, like, it doesn't have our address, but it's got the, the logo she made. Neat. So for envelopes, and so if people want to put their own address on it. Oh, cool. Or it can be used to make it stationary or whatever. It's a, it's, cool. She left it at the store. It's a, All right. It's a, another attention to detail that's a total Donovan thing. Totally. That should be a lot of fun. But we've added some things that, uh, uh, thankfully, we've been allowed to do. You know, we've done midnight openings before, and... We have another one coming up on July 4th. And this is a big one. Because initially it was going to be for Batman 50. And then like, oh, you know, Catwoman number one is out that day as well. But, you know, when when DC lets us do a midnight launch, we get to sell all of DC's product as well. Well, July 4th, very patriotic day. All about America. All about Captain America. As Captain America number one from ta Coates and Lionel Francis Yu comes out. So Marvel is also letting us sell that book and all of their products at midnight on the 4th of July. And it's the 4th of July. Most people are going to be off. So you can get the majority of your books, just Marvel and DC. Like you get at GameStop. Exactly. And like some DC Direct, which (laughs) you can get there. Um, You know, any, any of their merchandise that comes out as well. You know, no image or Oni or... What have we'll you. wait and see. Yeah. Sometimes uh, a few of those companies have been like, "Yeah, okay, you might as well get ours too." But I think it. I think having it on a national I, I think holiday. Boom's done it. Boom did it for uh, yeah for, for the last Power one, yeah. Rangers. For Power Rangers, sure. Because it was the same day as what Doomsday Clock or something. The last one we did, yeah. Yeah, so it can happen, sure. Uh, it, was it Doomsday Clock? It was. It was one after that, wasn't there? I don't know what would have been. I feel after like that. there was, but uh, Doomsday Clock. Yeah, Action 1000. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm like, it couldn't have been like yeah, eight Doom's months like, ago. Yeah, Doomsday Clock was too long ago. I Standard mean, Grid hasn't I, run that long. It feels <laughs> like it has, but still. No, you're right. Action 1000. Uh, yeah, so that's like having it be a, a a holiday where people are off. I think we might have more people coming in at midnight. It's possible. Yeah, so we'll be opening up at 11.59 p.m. on uh, Tuesday, July 3rd and staying open for, let's just say, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, As need merits. Yeah. I, we if if we you're not coming able... in at midnight and you're going to think you're going to come in later, 
Maybe call first. Yeah, we won't be open any later than 1 a.m. Because we basically have to reopen at 11 a.m. And we'd both like to get to our homes and go to sleep. I would like to do that today. So the uh, the, yeah, the amount of time we'll be open for is as long as there's people in the store. And once there's no one in the store, we're pretty much closing that up. Uh, I got to tell you, we had big, big plans for this day. Uh-huh. And uh, we we knew I, about... I, I didn't. <laughs> we knew about... Yeah, yeah, you did. Did I? Yeah. Okay. We knew about Catwoman... Oh, I, in, I thought you meant today. I'm like, no, 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 no. I didn't. <laughs> no, we knew about Catwoman oh, a sure. while ago because Joelle is a good friend of the stores. Yeah. And we had made plans with her to do something for it. And as it got closer, we were trying to, to sharpen those up. But uh, when it came down to actually plan things, it, it didn't work out. Schedules yeah. and timing just don't work. But we were close, man. We were close to having Joelle Jones in store for July 4th. Yeah, hopefully at some point in the future. Yeah, I mean, she's she, we've had Joelle to the store twice before, mm-hmm. and I have no doubt we'll do it again. She's one of my favorite guests we've ever had, and I will find reasons to bring her back to the store. Sure. But it would have been uh, it would have been great. It really would have. Uh and we we had another uh uh another swing and a miss this week, but those happen all the time. Sure. Those happen all the time in our business and yeah. trying to to set things up. And we won't even go into detail today because it, it obviously it wasn't going to happen. But um, we also have, uh, we haven't really announced this or put it anywhere, but for Junior Braves of the Apocalypse Volume 2, we're going to have Zach Laner in signing it all day the Wednesday that it comes out. Mm-hmm. And Volume 1 did well for us, mainly because of how good he is at pitching it. Yeah, it's true. And he's been in, uh, he did two free comic book days for us and, and a... a Junior Brave signing, standalone signing as well. So he's doing good at, at marketing this and building an audience. And I got worried for a second because I thought it came out the same Wednesday as Gen Con. Yeah, that's right. But it's the next one. Yeah, August 8th, yeah. I think, is when it comes out. Yeah. For, for a minute there, I'm like, oh, man. Oh, no. Hey, <laughs> I set up this, this eight-hour signing, and I'm not going to be there. Yeah. Have a good time. Tell yeah. Zach I said hi. But no, uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be fine. It'll be August 8th. Yeah. And we don't know what we're doing yet, but we're going to be doing something with Mike Norton for the release of the Lil Donnie collection. And I kind of want to know what people would like us to do for it. Like just a five to seven signing? Like something something bigger, something more involved, something on a weekend? I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I would like to see this book get into more hands, but it's a tough book to want to push because of the subject matter <laughs> sure and because of how mike has and this is the thing he's said repeatedly he doesn't enjoy doing this yeah it's it's like the alec baldwin playing donald trump thing like it's cathartic and then it's like still with this i gotta do this still yeah yeah so mike has been donating all the money he makes at conventions for the last like since uh, 2017 to uh, he, he chooses a different charity per convention and I told him we would work with him to do something along that lines for, for this book and this event. But again, it's all up in the air. I'm just uh, putting it out there now to, to, to let it stir in people's minds and to maybe have, someone will say, oh my God, you should totally do this. What you should do is you should make it a poll. Yeah. And then that way you can get uh, two 50-50 responses. Yeah, that would be good. That'd be my plan. That's, yeah. that's smart. So those are things we have coming up that we haven't necessarily put any publicity behind yet. I, I keep meaning to tell people that we have a full line of Harrow County enamel pins Mm -hmm. that we got direct from Colin. They're by Skelton Studios, the people that did all the lock and key keys. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who made them, and and Colin had them at uh, C2E2, but we got a bunch of them from him, and and they're they're very pretty. And if you like Harrow County, there's five different designs to choose from, and I, I, I like them. I think they're fun, and I think that's a neat thing that because we have a relationship with this creator... And because people are finding outside venues to promote and, well, market and sell their their work, that it's a thing that we get to offer to the people that come to Challengers that most other stores may not have. You can't just order these from Diamond or nope. from any Like, you, you can't. I mean, I'm sure Colin will sell them to other stores. Sure. But it's a matter of making that connection. And at the same time, we reach out to some other people to carry their stuff, and that, that hasn't worked yet. But we'll see. We'll see where it goes. 
Uh, also today we had a, a large Rachel Bard restock for the store. Yeah, including her new one. Her new book about bees. We got a bunch of those. Yeah. Uh, I almost said a bunch of those, but that didn't work. That's not a, a sw- sound. A swarm of those. That's good. That's good. Yeah, restocked everything. And it's, uh, when I saw the, the detailed note, I said, Donovan, did, did you decide on these quantities? Or? <laughs> She's like, oh, no, that was Dow. Like, yeah. okay. I mean, you didn't do wrong. It's, they're not wrong. Right. I was just like, it was so much depth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I gave her, like, can I read, can I read this uh, text? Uh, apparently, there was a lot happening in the store at that time. I'm sure. And as she was leaving, Rachel had said that, she blocked today aside to visit all the comic shops and restock places. Uh-huh. We were her second stop. She's done. She's sure. going home. Well, so I, I basically said, uh, like Donovan texted, you know, Rachel Bart is here. Am I paying her outright for books or what? She's got the new B ones because with a lot of local artists who work on a consignment basis. And I said, yeah, we buy them outright from her. Um, restock up to five copies on older ones. We'll take ten copies of the new one. Tell her her work is amazing. Nice. It's part of the text. Yep. Because if, if one of us were here, we'd make We'd sure that we would say to yeah. Rachel Bard hey your work is amazing yeah. uh, disappointed I was not in the store at that time you and me both <laughs> but I, I think Donovan's a fan as well so hopefully she, oh, was, yeah, she sure. was able to say you know convincingly that, that we are fans of hers but that's just another example of something that we as a store are excited about and get behind oh and, my God, yeah. and do really well with because of how great it is sure oh I forgot to see if we got any of the seashell ones hmm the ones that she glued inside seashells. Oh yeah, you told me about that. that like one. come out like it. a little fold out scroll. Probably yeah, not. Because yeah, the, the only one that Donovan mentioned was the B one. The B one, yeah. Uh, and we need to the, the the two people that we needed to to reconnect with to restock on uh, was uh, Rachel and uh, Izzy Izzy Rotman. Yeah. So we need to shoot Izzy an email at some point to sure. be like, hey, we need mini comics and pins. Yep. Because we need both. Well, there you have it. There's a snapshot of the week in comics as it relates to running a comical business store facility in a major metropolitan network on a... Uh, I don't want to say network again. Man, Too late. I talked myself out of it. Now, just because you I did this, right stupid, <laughs> this stupid rambling description last week, Dumb little word and I, I thought, nonsense. I'd, thought I'd call it, call it back and do it again and didn't work out no so all i can say is thanks for mock kicking oh golly did you know we didn't even talk about the huge vertigo announcement the last couple days oh well it's true we didn't i mean clearly you don't care (laughs) i mean i'm not suggesting we do it now i'm just pointing out that it was like a huge piece of news this week (laughs) is it though well if you don't think so then i guess it's not worth talking about uh i mean we can like okay so they already announced all the neil gaiman stuff which I thought was their Vertigo revamp. Nope. That was just part of it. That that was the... Uh, here's here's the, the foundation of it. You know, we've got Neil Gaiman working with four new writers yeah. to build out, like, a, a Neil Gaiman Sandman universe. But then today was Mark Doyle, who's who's the executive editor for Vertigo, formerly the bad editor. Um, bat. bat. Editor. B-A-T editor. Yeah. <laughs> Um, saying, here's all the stuff we've got coming out. And um, it's... Uh, it's a line of stuff it's, by a bunch of people. It's definitely comic books. Uh, I mean, is yeah. it Deathbed a Vertigo book? Yeah. Uh, honestly, like, for all of the stuff that they're listing here, it's like, boy, this just sounds a lot like Motherlands and Deathbed. And yeah. All, but it, I all mean, the stuff they've... Uh, Imaginary I, Fiends, where it's like, you've been publishing stuff like this for a while, and no one's really cared. Yeah, I don't know what about this calling it a relaunch when you've not nope. stopped publishing anything got a slightly different logo and trade dress i mean there's that <laughs> oh just the, the difference is the dc is different yeah um I'll, let's i'll go down the list of books real quick I'm, oh okay I'll, I'll, real quick i'm sorry i just i this felt like a, a big deal thing that we didn't talk about at all i mean i can see where they would think it's a big deal uh, Border Town from Eric Esquivel, who is uh, Adventure Time and Starburns Presents. Isn't uh, everybody who does comics, can't they have an Adventure Time credit yeah. to their name? Uh, Art and Covers by Ramon Villalobos. We actually found out about this from Ramon at yes. C2E2. He yes. had some pages and covers and stuff, and we went, oh, it looks yeah. really cool. He's a, he's a good artist. He's, he's a talented artist. He has a very unique yeah. style, and he deserves a wider recognition, and uh, we've had him sign in the store before. Hex Wives from Ben Blacker. 
who is the co-creator of the Thrilling Adventure Hour. Yeah, this is the first... Uh, it's not Acker and Blacker, it's just Blacker. Yeah, uh, art by Mirka Andolfo, who has done uh, Wonder Woman and Shade the Changing Girl. American Carnage from writer Brian Hill, who is, I guess, working on the Titans show. He's also done the Michael Cray comic. Yeah, isn't he the next detective writer, too? Yes, I think he's, a, he's doing the Black Lightning and the Outsiders arc. As a credit. Well, I guess he hasn't come out yet, so... Uh, Leandro Fernandez from The Names and Punisher Max is the artist. And didn't he do Hellblazer? Uh, Goddess Mode from uh, Zoe Quinn, who is uh, a uh, a writer and an activist about video games. Zoe Quinn... Would you say that she's a influencer? No. Zoe Quinn is, is a super interesting person and well worth uh, reading more about. I'm sure my description did not do it justice. Uh, she has lived... Uh, an interesting and tragic and triumphant life. One of the, the things that I'm most interested in is she was the initial target of Gamergate. Yeah. So it's interesting that, that after dealing with the toxicity of the game, game fandom, community, she she's to decided to start writing comic books, which is like, at best, a lateral move. Ugh. So uh, good luck. Uh, art by uh, Robbie Rodriguez, coming off of Spider-Gwen. Uh, which is weird, because we had heard a thing years ago that, that Robert Rodriguez uh, was not necessarily going to be working in comics very much longer, and Spider-Gwen would likely have been his final project, but yeah. I guess that is not the case. Uh, high Level from writer Rob Sheridan, who is the former art director for Nine Inch Nails. That is apparently a thing you can put in your credits. Art by Barnaby Bagenda, who is the artist for the Omega Men. Safe Sex. The artist for Omega Men or an artist for Omega Men? The main artist, I think. There was okay. somebody who did two other issues, I think. That, that, that was my question, if he was the yeah. two issue one or the... Uh, he was the, the main artist. Uh, okay. Safe Sex from writer Tina Horn, who is the host producer of Why Are People Into That Podcast? And artist Mike Dowling, who worked on Unfollow. Uh, Second Coming from writer Mark Russell. Yeah. Uh, from the Flintstones. Art by... Snagglepuss Chronicles. Exit stage left. Art by Richard Stage right even. Art by Richard Pace. All of these are comic books. The the thing that's a little surprising is um, how many there are. Well, how many? Um, that was the thing that I remember us being really surprised at and fearful for when Shelley Bond had her last gasp on Vertigo, and there was a lot of books coming out over a short window, and we thought, "Gosh, that's a lot of books that don't necessarily have huge names behind them," which means they're likely going to sink immediately and they pretty much all did i I get it a lot of the original vertigo books didn't necessarily have name creators on them but they They were people that were to be discovered and there was just so many fewer (laughs) comics coming out at the time most of the stuff that was coming out from the initial batch of vertigo books were either books that had already existed like sandman and hellblazer or were being done by creators that had been working in that sort of genre for a while you know, guys like Peter Milligan and a few, um, the Moonshadow guy. J.M.D. Mateus. Yeah, who had been doing a lot of stuff like that, so... Or John J. Muth, take your pick. Well, I, I, it wasn't John J. Muth, it was the writer, and that was the name I couldn't remember. So uh, those those books were not done by nobodies, you know? And even the stuff that, that would launch a little bit later, very little of it was by people who were just coming to it fresh. They were, you know, Garth Ennis's next book, Warren Ellis's next book. You know, stuff like that. This, it's a lot of people who don't write comics, or at least haven't written a lot of comics. I don't know how well their audiences are going to translate to comics. I'm, I'm willing to order a ton of it if people come in and they're like, what's a Zoe Quinn comic? I need to get this Zoe Quinn comic. Sometimes it happens. But not to denigrate the recently deceased, but Anthony Bourdain is a hugely famous personality. And author whose comic book work has not done that great. Did not do that great, I guess, now past tense. Uh, Hungry Ghosts and the uh, Get Jiro stuff did okay. There was some slight curiosity from people. Yeah. But it, it was not any in any way commensurate with how huge he was, you know, as, as a personality. So if if someone like him couldn't translate his fans into people who go buy a comic book or graphic novel, I don't know what chance the person who does a sex-positive education podcast is going to do. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I do, yes. Kerr and Acker are two people who I don't know anymore, but there was a time that the Thrilling Adventure Hour was massive. It, like, defined podcasts, basically, in the early days. The idea of all these incredibly funny, talented people in, in L.A., 
doing this bizarre, you know, sci-fi fantasy comedy podcast. But none of that Adventure Hour stuff has done well for us. Most of it we no. were club only on because, you know, the two or three copies we ordered of Sparks Nevada went unsold. So now what? And and Ben Blacker is one of the bigger names working on, on these books as far as writers go. Um, Mark Russell is someone that we like a lot, but, I mean, Snagglepuss doesn't do that great. Yeah. We're getting caught with a lot of those for the, yeah, the end yeah. of that series. So, yeah, I, I look at these books, and on the one hand, I'm like, these all sound interesting in concept but with so much vertigo stuff the concept hasn't been the problem it's the execution and a lot of the execution lately has been by people who are not used to doing comic books and this is a lot of learning on the job well i mean even when you do when you have two two names Uh when you have uh the guy who writes the flash Uh and the guy who drew batman Uh on a book together that doesn't that didn't do anything Uh, and it's actually a fun story. I think Deathbed was a fun idea. Sure. But it doesn't... It's... I don't know. It just seems like there's too many different subject matters and genres out there. Yeah. And, and I mean, none of this sounds like... A, none of these books sound like a home run. Like, between concept, creators, and genre, nothing in there has one book where it's like, all of it works. All of that's going to be great. Like, I'm either not confident on the creators or the concept sounds like something I've read before uh, or the genre is one where it just is not usually successful. What was Gail Simone's Vertigo book? Oh, um, uh, Clean Room. Clean Room was a good series and sure. that, that didn't do anything for us. I thought Motherlands was great. Nobody cared. Unfollow was a really fun premise. Yeah. Uh, Imaginary Fiends did okay to start with and then dropped off. Like I, Vertigo like, just... Like everything does. Vertigo is a brand. It's hard to pick something in the last couple years that really hit and they've tried a lot of different books with a lot of different creators you know some you know up and coming people at their superhero line who are doing mature reader stuff people who should have a fan following but it's just none of it seems like it's breaking through and nothing in this batch of books makes me think any of that's going to change we'll we'll stock it and if they've got decent ordering terms maybe we'll stock it heavy but yeah, a lot of this is like, I don't know, man. I need fans to come in and tell me... I want this. You know, uh, Safe Sex is a book that I've got to get copies of. Or High Level is a book I can't wait to read. You know? Until then, eh. Well, in keeping with this Vertigo relaunch, mm-hmm. have you heard that DC recently either reapplied for or re-upped or just for the first time outright trademarked Cliffhanger? <laughs> All right. Cliffhanger... Exclamation mark. Sure. For those who were far too young uh, and and vital and uh, have their lives ahead of them to know this, uh, Cliffhanger was one of many imprints at uh, Wildstorm. This one in particular was the home of J. Scott Campbell's uh, Danger, Danger Girl. Girl and Humberto Ramos's Crimson, Crimson and Joe Mad's Battle Chasers. I remember when that book came out. Yeah, it was very much an, an artist-driven line, and it was specifically like the hot fresh dudes at at wildstorm doing their own creator own projects how could we forget chris pacello's steampunk steampunk i literally you did, forgot you it did as for, i said it. it i knew it i started it and then i forgot it yeah um because we need another imprint we do yeah especially with uh you know young animal and brian michael bendis's whatever that's going to be and yeah I, I guess, if anything, I'd be very nervous about DC putting together another artist-driven line considering how the un- last one uneven the new age of DC heroes has been when that was supposed to be artist-driven, and then it's like every two issues, the artist is changing on those, those books, creating no consistency whatsoever. Where the writer is the only person who sticks around, it's very hard to say that's an artist-driven line. Yep. But good luck. And good luck to you in your upcoming week. Thanks for listening. And keep reading comics. This has been Contest of Challengers. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago. 773-278-0155. Keep up to date with new releases and events at challengerscomics.com. Like Challengers Comics on Facebook. Follow at Challengers on Twitter and help fund this podcast at patreon.com slash challengers.